Ladies and gentlemen, I shall begin by asking you a hypothetical question. Suppose that you were born and are now growing up in some miserable little village, lost in some trackless prairies, miles away from civilization. You have never seen anyone but a handful of dull, stagnant, brutalized people who spend their lives in the meaningless drudgery of the same routine of labor year after year with no interest, no purpose, no ambition beyond the range of their immediate needs. You are growing up with an incoherent, inarticulate sense of longing for something better, something beyond the meanness, the pettiness, the sordidness of the men around you. Whenever you are bewildered, disappointed, or hurt by people, whenever you encounter injustice and irrationality, you struggle to hang on to the formless hope that you will not surrender, that your life will have meaning, importance, and beauty, that you will reach something greater, somehow, somewhere, in some distant future. But you are not yet able to identify what that something is. You know it only in the form of a desperate emotion, and your torture comes from those moments when you wonder whether your undefined ideal can ever be achieved in reality, whether the men around you are right, whether a lethargic resignation to pain and ugliness is all that's possible to men on earth. Now suppose that your only contact with the rest of mankind is a movie theater where a film is shown once a month. It is your only chance to catch a glimpse of the world beyond your native village. Ask yourself, what will happen to you if that movie screen shows you New York City or if it shows you 10 variants of your own village? Project the two alternatives. Either you see New York with everything it implies with the kind of intelligence, energy, courage, ambition that created it, or you see the meanness, the sordidness, the futility, the despair of your own village staring at you from the vacant eyes and loose faces and senseless lives of the men in other villages. What will either picture do to you? What will it do to your view of life, to your values, to your soul, to your future? If you understand the difference that these two alternatives would make to you, you understand the nature and the meaning of art in human existence. Do not make the mistake of concluding that the purpose of art is education or enlightenment or propaganda or any kind of narrow didactic message. Art is the expression of man's deepest, most fundamental, most philosophical values. Art is the concretization of metaphysics. Let me explain this fully. Metaphysics is that branch of philosophy which studies the nature of reality, the basic nature of existence and of man. Most men do not hold any conscious philosophical convictions and have never heard of metaphysics. Yet all men have a philosophy of life that directs their choices and actions. If they do not form it consciously, they form it subconsciously, by means of an emotional generalization, by an unidentified, unverbalized estimate of the value and meaning of their own existence. Observe, for example, that some people are always attracted to the new, the original, the untried, that they like to take risks, to venture out, to stand on their own, while other people, in the same circumstances, prefer to play it safe, to stick to the customary, the established, the known. The first kind are motivated primarily by the desire to seek enjoyment or gain. The second kind are motivated primarily by the desire to protect themselves from suffering or loss. Under any superficial reason they may give for their choices, their basic reason is a philosophical estimate of man's position in the universe which they have formed subconsciously. The first kind have concluded that life is good, that success, happiness, the achievement of his values are possible to men. The second kind have concluded that life is evil, that man is doomed to fail, that existence by its very nature is set against him, and that disaster is his metaphysical fate. Neither of these two types may have given any conscious thought to these questions, and may not have any consciously reasoned grounds for their views. Yet their emotions have summed up their experiences and have become a basic attitude toward life, 
a basic motivation. In the presence of a new experience, the immediate reaction of the first type of man will be eagerness or enthusiasm. The immediate reaction of the second type will be fear. It is in this manner that most men form their convictions, their answers to the basic questions of philosophy. Is the essential nature of existence benevolent to man or malevolent? Is man by his essential nature good or evil? Is the universe intelligible to man or unintelligible and unknowable? Can man be happy on earth or is he doomed to despair and frustration? Does man have the power of choice, the power to direct the course of his own life, to choose his values, set his goals and achieve them? Or is he the helpless plaything of forces beyond his control which determine his fate? All of us have formed our answers to these questions, whether we know it consciously or not, and these answers direct our actions, our choices, our preferences, our tastes, our values. Man cannot escape the fact that he needs a philosophy of life, that is, a basic, comprehensive view of himself and of his relationship to existence. His only choice is whether he forms his philosophy by a process of thought or by accidental emotional associations, whether he holds his philosophy consciously or subconsciously, whether his philosophy is true or false. All men form their first philosophy of life on the subverbal subconscious level. Most of them leave it there for the rest of their days. A few learn to translate it into conscious terms, to consider it, to correct it if necessary, and to acquire a reasoned philosophy of life. That which some men hold in the form of a philosophical conviction, most men hold in the form of an emotion. Observe that under any specific particular momentary emotion you may experience, there is a deeper emotional undertone, a constant which seldom varies, a leitmotif so deeply rooted in your consciousness that you take it for granted and are seldom able to identify it. That is a metaphysical emotion. That is your basic estimate of yourself and of existence. That is your sense of life. A sense of life is the emotional counterpart of metaphysics. It is the metaphysics of the subconscious. You have heard the expression, a tragic sense of life, used by philosophers and aestheticians. Tragic is not the only possible attribute of that concept. There can be a tragic sense of life, or a benevolent sense of life, or a heroic sense of life, etc., according to one's basic estimate. Those who hold a conscious, rational philosophy do not lose their sense of life, but their philosophy and their sense of life are integrated, unified into perfect harmony. They have no conflicts between their ideas and their emotions. Others whose conscious or subconscious premises are irrational may find themselves torn by the conflict between their ideas and their sense of life. Still others have nothing but their sense of life to guide them. But whatever the case may be, all men possess and retain a sense of life. It is this aspect of man's consciousness that is the special domain, the realm, the concern, and the source of art. Art is the expression and the projection of a man's sense of life. For many people, art is the only form of philosophical experience and the only source of philosophical knowledge. Art is a recreation of reality according to the artist's values. It is not a creation out of a void, but a recreation, a selective rearrangement of the elements of reality guided by an artist's view of existence. That view determines the subject he chooses to present and every detail of the manner in which he presents it. It determines both the what and the how of his work. An artist declares his metaphysical estimates by means of that which he chooses to include or to omit, to emphasize or to ignore, 
by means of the subject he selects, of the particular aspects he stresses, of the specific attributes he features. For instance, one can make a statue of man as a Greek god or as a deformed oriental monstrosity. Both are metaphysical estimates of man. Both are projections of the artist's view of man's nature. One can paint a still life of some fruit and flowers in a manner that will convey a benevolent, glowing, sunlit sense of life. One can paint the same fruit and flowers in a manner that will project decay, corruption, and a sense of murky doom. An artist may or may not choose to include some explicit philosophical message in his work. That choice is optional. The real, basic, essential message which every artwork conveys, whether the artist intended it consciously or not, is the concretization of a sense of life. Now, why do men need such a concretization? Why does art have such a profound significance for men? Why did mankind produce works of art since its earliest primitive prehistorical days? The answer lies in the nature of man's consciousness. Observe that man is the only living species that produces works of art. Animals have no art. Observe also that an artwork is distinguished from utilitarian objects by the fact that it is not a means to any specific practical end, but is an end in itself. It serves no purpose other than contemplation, and the pleasure of that contemplation is experienced as a self-sufficient, self-justifying primary. Yet art does serve a human need, only it is not a physical existential need. It is a need of man's consciousness. Man cannot survive as animals do by the automatic guidance of his senses on the perceptual level of knowledge. His survival requires conceptual knowledge, that is, the ability to form abstractions and concepts out of his perceptual material the ability to reason, the ability to think. But thinking is not automatic or infallible. Man must choose to think, he must choose to acquire knowledge, he must discover the right values, the right view of existence to guide his actions. A full, explicit metaphysics, a philosophical view of existence requires so long and complex a chain of conceptual knowledge so great a sum of abstractions, definitions, and conclusions that no man could hold it all in the focus of his conscious awareness in any given instant. Yet he needs that sum and that awareness to guide him. That sum is added up by his emotions. That awareness is given to him by art. Art makes it possible for man to perceive his abstract values by an act of direct, immediate awareness, to contemplate his widest abstractions in the form of specific physical concretes. In effect, art brings man's concepts to the perceptual level of his consciousness and allows him to grasp them directly as if they were percepts. For instance, consider the simplest example, the character of Cinderella in the fairy story. It would take hours to list, to describe, and to define all the complex issues and attitudes of a young person's progression through poverty, obscurity, suffering, injustice, to an ultimate triumph, and it would take much longer to isolate them from the irrelevant accidental events in the lives of such struggling young persons as you might have observed. It is the selective product of that enormous sum of observations and abstractions that the character of Cinderella embodies. And when people refer to a girl as a Cinderella, it is the product of that enormous sum that they convey by means of a single image. When people refer to a man as a Romeo, or a Scrooge, or a Babbitt, they convey by means of a single figure an enormous sum of psychological, sociological, and moral characteristics. Readers of The Fountainhead have told me more than once that the character of Howard Rourke helped them to make a decision when they were faced with moral dilemmas. They asked themselves, what would Rourke do in this situation? And 
faster than their mind could identify or analyze the proper application of all the complex principles involved, the image of Rourke gave them the answer. They sensed almost instantaneously what he would or would not do, and this helped them to isolate and to identify the reasons, the moral principles that would have guided him. Such is one of the functions of a personified human ideal. The basic function of art is to integrate, to concretize, and to project man's abstract metaphysical evaluation of himself and of existence. Art presents to man a view of his place in the universe. Art concretizes the values man is to seek, projects the goal he is to pursue, and holds before him the vision of the life he is to achieve. Or, if such is the artist's premise, Art can tell men that values are futile, that man is helpless, that despair and resignation are his only proper states. By means of a selective recreation of reality, an artwork declares to man, in effect, this is the nature of existence, this is what you are to expect, these are the things you are to hold as of significance, of importance, of value to your life. Every work of art be it a novel, a painting, a statue, or a symphony, broadcasts that message, and every viewer hears it, whether he identifies it consciously or not. A man responds to a work of art by means of his own sense of life. Faster than his mind could name it, his emotions sum up the meaning of the artwork and accept it or reject it, according to whether it does or does not represent his own metaphysical estimate. The aesthetic response of a rational viewer to a statue of man as a godlike figure will be an emotion of joy, of acceptance, of affirmation. He will feel, in effect, yes, this is the real nature of man. The aesthetic response of an irrational viewer will be an emotion of fear, of resentment, of rejection. He will feel, no, this is not real, I don't want it to be real. In response to a statue of man as a deformed monstrosity, a rational viewer will experience an emotion of disgust, resentment, and rejection. An irrational viewer will experience an emotion of relief, of reassurance, a suspension of his chronic fear and guilt, a justification of his hatred for existence. Such is the nature of art and of that mysterious aesthetic emotion which the aestheticians of mysticism have always proclaimed to be some sort of inexplicable, undefinable primary, unrelated to the rest of man's consciousness, and granted only to a chosen few among men like some special sixth sense. Man's aesthetic emotion is the exact opposite of the mystic's view, the exact opposite of a special sense or of an irreducible primary. Man's aesthetic emotion is a complex psychological sum, the result, product, and expression of his sense of life. But aesthetics is a branch of philosophy, and emotions are not tools of cognition. Just as a philosopher does not approach any other branch of his science with his emotions as his criterion of judgment, so he cannot do it in the field of aesthetics if he is to be a philosopher as distinguished from a soothsayer. A sense of life is not a sufficient professional equipment for an aesthetician. An aesthetician, as well as any man who attempts to pass judgment on art or even to discuss it in intelligible terms, must be guided by more than an emotion. He must know the objective meaning and source of that emotion, the subconscious philosophical premises from which it comes. He must translate his sense of life into a conscious philosophical metaphysics, must reconsider and correct it if necessary, and must hold it as a conscious conviction, not as a blind, unaccountable emotion. He must learn to identify the nature of art and of all its complex elements. He must learn to grasp the abstractions of values, metaphysics, sense of life, as apart from his particular values, metaphysics, and sense of life, then assess an artist's work in relation to the artist's purpose, by a conscious rational judgment, not by a blind emotional reaction of liking or disliking. 
Some artworks will always have a greater personal meaning for him than other works of equal or even greater artistic merit. That personal meaning is the response of one's own sense of life to that of the artist, and it represents one's real enjoyment of art. But qua aesthetician, one must be able to identify and to evaluate the work of an artist qua artist, apart from and regardless of his philosophical ideas, that is, the technical professional mastery with which an artist uses his means to achieve his ends, to project his view of life. For instance, one may dislike the subject of a painting but admire the skill and mastery of the artist's style. One may appreciate a writer's style while disliking or opposing the content of his story, his ideas, and his sense of life. One may appreciate the how of an artwork while disapproving of the what. An objective professional judgment in the field of art is extremely difficult to achieve and is almost non-existent today. It requires an unusual degree of introspection and philosophical training. Today, the leading schools of philosophy are schools of neo-mysticism and, consequently, aesthetics is regarded as a field belonging to and ruled by some sort of undefinable, incommunicable, ineffable emotions which are experienced only by some sort of special mystic elite. This kind of premise makes judgment, integrity, discussion, and art itself impossible, as witness the state of today's art. The unintelligible emotions and revelations of mystic oracles can be of no value or significance to anyone, except to the primordial jungle from which they stem. Throughout most of mankind's history, mysticism has held a monopoly on, on man's values, a monopoly on morality and on art. In primitive societies, art was the servant of religion. It created temples, idols, gods. It projected those forces which man was to regard as the rulers of the universe and of his own destiny. In most of mankind's art, man himself was presented as a weak, helpless, terrified, distorted, and deformed creature. But there were exceptions. There were three periods in history when Western culture was dominated by a philosophy of reason. Ancient Greece, the Renaissance, the 19th century. It is only in these three periods that the dominant trend in art was not dedicated to the degrading and deforming of man, but to the glorification of man, of his existence, and of this earth. The greatest artistic innovation of the 19th century was a new literary form, the novel. Prior to the late 18th century, the novel did not exist. What did exist in literature was only plays, poems, and sagas or chronicles. These last were fictionalized biographies of historical figures or of legendary heroes and gods. Some historians may regard certain earlier works, for instance Don Quixote, as novels, but such works are closer to chronicles than to novels in literary form. Prior to the 19th century, literature presented man as a helpless being whose life and actions were determined by forces beyond his control, either by fate and the gods, as in the Greek tragedies, or by an innate weakness, a tragic flaw, as in the plays of Shakespeare. Writers regarded man as metaphysically impotent, incapable of achieving his goals or of directing the course of his life. All of them shared the premise of determinism. On that premise, one could not project what might happen to man. One could only record what did happen. And chronicles were the appropriate literary form of such recording. The concept of fiction in the full sense of the word was impossible. Man as a being of free will did not appear in literature until the 19th century, and the novel was his proper literary form. The great new art movement of the 19th century was Romanticism, and the Romantic novel was its greatest expression. Romanticism saw man as a being able to choose his values and to achieve them, able to reach his goals, able to control his own existence. 
The Romantic writers did not regard man as a placing of unknowable forces. They regarded him as a product of his own value choices. And, exchanging the role of chroniclers for the role of creators, they did not record the events that had happened, but projected the events that should happen. They did not record the choices that men had made, but projected the choices that men ought to make. They lived up fully to the literary principle formulated by Aristotle. Aristotle said that fiction is of greater philosophical importance than history, because history presents things only as they are, while fiction presents them as they might be and ought to be. The hallmark and the proudest distinction of the romantic novel was the plot. A plot is a purposeful progression of events. A plot structure is a series of integrated, logically connected events moved by a central purpose, leading to the resolution of a climax. A plot structure is the dramatization of man's free will. It is the physical form of his spiritual sovereignty, of his power to deal with existence. The romantic novel was the product of two factors, of reason and of capitalism of the Aristotelian influence which, in the 19th century, gave man the confident power to choose his own goals, and of the political-economic system that left him free to achieve them. With the resurgence of mysticism and collectivism in the later part of the 19th century, the romantic novel was the first thing to vanish. The romantic movement vanished gradually from all the arts as the artists undertook once more the task of degrading men. Man's new enemy in art was naturalism. Naturalism rejected the concept of free will and went back to a view of man as a helpless creature determined by forces beyond his control. Only now the new ruler of man's destiny was held to be society. The naturalists proclaimed that values have no power and no place, neither in human life nor in literature, that writers must present men, quote, as they are, close quote, which meant must record whatever they happen to see around them, that they must not pronounce value judgments nor project abstractions, but must content themselves with a faithful transcription, a carbon copy of any existing concrete. This was a return to the literary principle of the chronicle. But since a novel was to be an invented chronicle, the novelist was faced with the problem of what to use as his standard of selection. When values are declared to be impossible, how is one to know what to record, what to regard as important or significant? Naturalism solved the problem by substituting statistics for a standard of value. That which could be claimed to be typical of a large number of men in any given geographical area or period of time was regarded as metaphysically significant and worthy of being recorded. That which was rare, unusual, exceptional was regarded as unimportant and unreal. Just as the new schools of philosophy became progressively dedicated to the negation of philosophy, so naturalism was dedicated to the negation of the essence of art. Instead of presenting a metaphysical view of man and of existence, the naturalist presented a journalistic view. In answer to the question, what is man? They said, this is what the village grocers are in the south of France in the year 1887, or this is what the inhabitants of the slums are in New York in 1921, or these are the fox next door. Art, the integrator of metaphysics, the concretizer of men's widest abstractions, was shrinking to the level of a plodding, concrete-bound dolt who has never looked past the blocks he, li he lives on or beyond the range of the moment. But the essence of a medium cannot be negated. Art is the voice of metaphysics, and it continued to function as such, no matter what its new practitioners were alleging. alleging. While the naturalist painters and writers were proclaiming themselves to be merely photographers and reporters, 
It is their own metaphysical views that they were expressing. The idea that the role of photographer or reporter is the only role realistically appropriate to men is itself a metaphysical idea. And it is a metaphysical view of men and of existence that their audiences were hearing. That view, in effect, was man is helpless, man is impotent, look at him as he is at this moment because he has no power to change it, no choice, purpose, no values are possible to him, don't hope, don't struggle, life is senseless, aimless, meaningless. This is the metaphysical message broadcast by any naturalistic novel. It is not changed by the fact that the early naturalist writers were often crusaders for social causes and advocated social reforms. In this capacity, they were merely crusading journalists and their novels functioned as Sunday supplement exposés. As novels, they projected the bleak metaphysics of determinism, of man's hopelessness and impotence. The meaning of romantic novels to the reader was not the concrete specific adventures of the characters, not their loves, struggles, or triumphs, but the view of man as a free, purposeful being, and the view of life as an exciting, inspiring, often difficult, but unlimited achievement. In the same way, the meaning of naturalistic novels was not the statistical survey of the speech habits, dinner menus, and adultery rates of specific regional groups, but the view of man as a scared, petty, irrational automaton jerking senselessly on the invisible strings of unknowable forces and the view of life as a process of pointless, meaningless, incomprehensible torture. It did not take long for the philosophical roots of naturalism to come out into the open. At first, by the standard that substituted the collective for the objective, the naturalists consigned the exceptional man to unreality and presented only the man who could be taken as typical of some group or another, high or low. Then, since they saw more miseries and prosperity on earth, they began to regard prosperity as unreal and to present only misery, poverty, the slums, the lower classes. Then, since they saw more mediocrities and greatness around them, they began to regard greatness as unreal and to present only the mediocre, the average, the common, the undistinguished. Since they saw more failures than success, they took success to be unreal and presented only human failure, frustration, defeat. Since they saw more suffering than happiness, they took happiness to be unreal and presented only suffering. Since they saw more ugliness than beauty, they took beauty to be unreal and presented only ugliness. Since they saw more vice than virtue, they took virtue to be unreal and presented only vice, crime, corruption, perversion, depravity. Now, take a look at modern literature. Man, the nature of man, the metaphysically significant, important, essential about man, is now represented by dipsomaniacs, drug addicts, sexual perverts, homicidal maniacs, and psychotics. The subjects of modern literature are such themes as the hopeless love of a bearded lady for a mongoloid pinhead in a circus sideshow, or the dilemma of a little boy whose genteel maiden aunt has a secret passion for cutting the throats of birds and kittens, or the problem of a married couple whose child was born with six fingers on her left hand, or the tragedy of a gentle young man who just can't help murdering strangers in the park for kicks. All this is still presented to us under the naturalistic heading of a slice of life or real life or a fearless image of the truth about man's soul, but the old slogans have worn thin. The obvious question to which the heirs of statistical naturalism have no answer is, if heroes and geniuses are not to be regarded as representative of mankind by reason of their numerical rarity, why are freaks and monsters to be regarded as representative? 
why are the problems of a bearded lady of greater universal significance than the problems of a genius? Why is the soul of a murderer worth studying, but not the soul of a hero? The answer, of course, lies in the basic metaphysical premise of naturalism in its sense of life, whether its practitioners ever chose it consciously or not. As an outgrowth of modern philosophy, that basic premise is anti-man, anti-mind, anti-life. And as an outgrowth of the altruist morality, naturalism is a frantic escape from the responsibility of volition, of choice, of values, an escape from moral judgment, a long, wailing, howling plea for pity, for tolerance, for the forgiveness of anything. The literary cycle has swung all the way around. What you read today is not naturalism any longer. It is symbolism. It is the presentation of a metaphysical view of man as opposed to a journalistic or statistical view. But it is the symbolism of the jungle. According to this modern view of man, depravity represents man's real, essential, metaphysical nature, while virtue does not. Virtue is only an accident, an exception, or an illusion. Therefore, a monster is a projection of man's essence, but a hero is not. The Romanticists did not present a hero as a statistical average but as an abstraction of man's best and highest potentiality, applicable to and achievable by all men in various degrees, according to their individual choices. For the same reasons, in the same manner, but on an opposite metaphysical premise, today's writers do not present a monster as a statistical average, but as an abstraction of man's worst and lowest potentiality which they regard as applicable to and essential in all men, not, however, as a potentiality, but as a hidden actuality. The Romanticists presented heroes as larger than life. Now, monsters are presented as larger than life, or rather, man is presented as smaller than life. If men hold a rational philosophy, including the conviction that they possess free will, the image of a hero guides and inspires them. If men hold an irrational philosophy, including the conviction that they are helpless automatons, the image of a monster serves to reassure them. They feel, in effect, I am not that bad. The metaphysical meaning and the vested interest of presenting man as a loathsome monstrosity is the hope and the demand for a moral blank check. As an illustration of the modern view of man, let me quote from an article by Joseph Wood Crouch in the New York Times magazine of March 19, 1961. Discussing the work of those who are regarded as today's most prominent and serious playwrights, Mr. Crouch states, quote, Tennessee Williams, Anouilly, Beckett, Genet, and Ionesco share with each other an attitude which appears to be both a despair of human nature itself and a moral nihilism. Anouilly is bitterly cynical in a passion which relates him more clearly than any of the others to a tradition of worldliness. The others are not so much worldly as out of this worldly. To them, man is not merely egotistical, tre treacherous, and cruel. He is also so absurd that he cannot be rationally presented and is to be truly revealed only as a figure in a surrealist nightmare." Close quote. Referring specifically to Tennessee Williams, Mr. Crouch states that Williams created, quote, the impression that to be human is, in his view, necessarily to be sick in one way or another. His character seemed to be involved in what one is inclined to call not a tragic predicament, but rather an unsavory mess." Close quote. Now let me quote from a news story about one Edward Albee, published in a Harvard student newspaper, the Harvard Crimson, 
on March 27, 1961. Quote, People claim that the new forces in drama today are concerned with nihilism, anti-theater, anti-people, and anti-God. Edward Albee, author of the prize-winning off-Broadway play Zoo Story, declared last night. Well, so they are. Be glad of it. In a speech which concluded the four-day Quincy Holmes Arts Festival, Albee declared that the new playwrights were now concerned with with the absurdity of man in the universe. It's a good sign after a very long hiatus that they're concerned with fundamentals, he said. It's a very positive movement." Close quote. I will ask you to remember that absurdity is an evaluative term. If man is metaphysically absurd, so are all his works, actions, and evaluations. If so, then who is it that evaluates him as absurd and by what standard? Draw your own conclusion. If you wonder about the psychological motives, the cultural goals, and the social purposes of those who produce, promote, and acclaim that sort of stuff, let me read you a quotation which you may regard as prophetic and which will show you that abstract principles do work in reality. This is from The Fountainhead, published in 1943. It is an excerpt from a scene in which Ellsworth Stewie, an altruistic collectivist, explains to Ike, a pretentious mediocrity, that he is going to build him up into a great playwright. Quote, Suppose I didn't like Ibsen. Ibsen is good, said Ike. Sure he's good, but suppose I didn't like him. Suppose I wanted to stop people from seeing his plays. It would do me no good whatever to tell them so. But if I sold them the idea that you're just as great as Ibsen, pretty soon they wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Jesus, can you? It's only an example, Ike. But it would be wonderful. Yes, it would be wonderful. And then it wouldn't matter what they went to see at all. Then nothing would matter, neither the writers nor those for whom they wrote. How is that, Ellsworth? Look, Ike, there's no room in the theater for both Ibsen and you. You do understand that, don't you? In a manner of speaking, yes. Well, you do want me to make room for you, don't you? All of this useless discussion has been covered before and much better, said Gus Webb. Who had been nothing shall be all. Close quote. Such is the purpose and the dominant trend of modern literature. Trend is too active a word to use. Blind alley would be more accurate. There is no further place to go. As to modern art, what it offers us are the clumsy drawings of dismembered parts of a distorted human figure done in the style of an inept three-year-old, or the whirls and smudges of somebody's paintbrush on a piece of canvas, alleged to be a representation of somebody's emotions, or the solution of the problems of perspective and three-dimensionality by means of gluing gobs of plastic, vegetable peelings, or human hair on a canvas. That this is regarded as art, that it is shown in museums, written about in magazines and taught in colleges does have philosophical significance. It is the ultimate leer of mysticism at the destruction of men, of reason, and of reality. One of these schools of alleged art confesses it openly by entitling itself non-objective. In modern sculpture, man is presented when he is recognizable at all as a barely differentiated chunk of stone with the limbs of a malformed gorilla. In modern music, the ability to produce screeching noises less melodious than the sounds of a traffic jam is offered to us with the supercilious advice that we must recondition our sensory perceptions. If you wonder about the ultimate destination toward which modern philosophy and modern art are leading you, its signs and symptoms are now visible all around us. 
observe that literature is returning to the art form of the pre-industrial ages, to the chronicle, that fictionalized biographies of real people, of politicians, baseball players, or Chicago gangsters, are given preference over works of imaginative fiction in novels, in the theater, on the movie and television screens, and that a favored literary form is the documentary. Observe that in painting, sculpture, and music, the latest vogue, fashion, and inspirational model is the primitive art of the jungle. Now consider a curious paradox. The same aestheticians and intellectuals who advocate the philosophy of collectivism with the subordination of all values and of everyone's existence to the rule of the masses, with art as the voice of the people, these same men are resentfully antagonistic toward the popular taste in art. You have heard their virulent denunciations of the mass media, of the so-called commercial producers or publishers who happen to attract large audiences and to please the public. You have heard them demand government subsidies for the artistic ventures which the people do not enjoy and do not choose to support voluntarily. Enjoyment is not part of the modern intellectual's view of life or of art. According to their dogma, that which is entertaining cannot be serious. To be serious, a work has to bore you to death. Any financially successful, that is, popular work of art is automatically worthless, while any unpopular failure is automatically great, provided it is unintelligible. Anything that can be understood is vulgar and primitive. Only inarticulate language, smears of paint, and the noise of radio static are civilized, sophisticated, and profound. The popularity or unpopularity, the box office success or failure of any work of art is not, of course, a criterion of aesthetic merit. No value, aesthetic, philosophical, or moral, can be established by counting noses. Fifty million Frenchmen can be as wrong as one. But while a crude Philistine who takes financial success as proof of artistic merit can be regarded as a mindless parasite on art, what is one to think of the standards, motives, and intentions of those who take financial failure as the proof of artistic merit? If the snobbery of mere financial success is reprehensible, what is the meaning of a snobbery of failure? Draw your own conclusions. Art is an expression of one's sense of life. Where in today's culture do we find any remnant of the joyous, the benevolent, the confident, the beautiful, the exciting? The last refuge of the romantic spirit is now an unacknowledged underground, the field of popular entertainment. In literature, it is the detective novel. In painting, it is the commercial art of advertisements, calendars, or magazine illustrations. In music, it is apparatus, musical comedies, and occasionally popular tunes. Why is the cheerful and the beautiful surrendered to superficial treatment? Why are the higher reaches of artistic skill devoted exclusively to the colors of festering wounds and the sounds of cosmic wailing? I shall let you hear the words of a thinker whose views are the diametrical opposite of mine. I shall quote from a book entitled, approvingly, not accusingly, Irrational Men, by William Barrett, a professor of philosophy at New York University and a leading proponent of existentialism. I agree with his culture diagnosis, so not with his philosophical ideas, his literary preferences, or his aesthetic values. Quote, the classical tradition in literature deriving from Aristotle's poetics, tells us that a drama, and consequently any other literary work, must have a beginning, middle, and end. The author subordinates himself to the requirements of logic, necessity, probability. His structure must be an intelligible whole in which each part develops logically out of what went before. However, it is important to note that this canon of intelligible literary structure 
beginning, middle, and end with a well-defined climax, arose in a culture in which the universe too was believed to be an ordered structure, a rational and intelligible whole. What happens if we try to apply this classical Aristotelian canon to a modern work like Joyce's Ulysses? 734 pages of power and dullness, beauty and sordidness, comedy and pathos, where the movement is always horizontal, never ascending toward any crisis, and where we detect not the shadow of anything like a climax in the traditional sense of that term. It is, in fact, the banal, greasy thing that we leave, that Joyce gives us, in comparison with which most other fiction is indeed fiction. This world is dense, opaque, unintelligible. That is the datum from which the modern artist always starts. Close quote. And further from the same book. Quote. The oriental song baffles the ear of the westerner. It appears unintelligible. The reason is that the Westerner demands, or let us say used to demand, an intelligibility that the Easterner does not. If the Westerner finds the Oriental music meaningless, the Oriental might very well reply that this is the meaninglessness of nature itself, which goes on endlessly without beginning, middle, or end. The Oriental has accepted his existence within a universe that would appear to be meaningless to the rational Western mind, and has lived with this meaninglessness. Hence, the artistic form that seems natural to the Oriental is one that is just as formless, as irrational as life itself. That the Western artist now finds his own inherited classical form unconvincing and indeed almost intolerable is because of a profound change in his total attitude toward the world. Close quote. This is what modern philosophy has done to art, to Western civilization, and to mankind. Observe that what the Western artist now finds intolerable is rationality. Observe that his purpose is to teach you to live meaninglessly, to live without beginning, middle, or end, like nature, that is, like inanimate objects. Since inanimate objects do not choose any purpose, do not draw any logical inferences, do not exercise any rationality, do not pursue any values, do not possess any aesthetic preferences, since quote, beauty and sordidness, comedy and pathos, close quote, are all one to a granite boulder or to a corpse, man should not aspire to any of it either. Life to Professor Barrett is the banal, gritty thing that we live. Who made it so? What power predestines our lives to be banal and gritty? Is it the fact that inanimate objects Rocks, sands, oceans, mud piles fail to equip us with originality, harmony, values, purpose, and meaning. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the philosophical voice behind your unaccountable aesthetic emotions, if any of you are advocates of modern art. This is the meaning of those higher secrets, ineffable visions, and mysterious depths that cannot be expressed in words. This is the explanation of your inexplicable longings. And if any of you rebel against reason, if you succumb to the old bromides of the witch doctors, such as the cold hand of reason, or reason kills, or reason is the enemy of the artist, or reason dissects and destroys the joyous spontaneity of man's soul, his creative imagination, his long vital, I will suggest that you take note of the following fact. By rejecting reason and surrendering to the unhampered sway of their unleashed emotions and whims, the apostles of irrationality, the existentialists, the Zen Buddhists, the non-objective artists, have not achieved a free, joyous, triumphant sense of life, 
but a sense of doom, nausea, banality, grittiness, and screaming cosmic terror. Then read the stories of O. Henry, or listen to the music of Viennese operettas, and remember that these were the products of the spirit of the 19th century, a century ruled by the cold, dissecting hand of reason. And then ask yourself, which epistemological way of life is appropriate to men, which is consonant with the facts of reality and of man's nature? Just as a man's aesthetic preferences are the sum of his metaphysical values and the barometer of his soul, so art is the sum and the barometer of a culture. Modern art is the most eloquent demonstration of our aesthetic, philosophical, and cultural bankruptcy. Focus for a moment on the terrifying spectacle of a culture which, on the one hand, has discovered nuclear energy, has produced hydrogen bombs, has sent a man into outer space, and, on the other hand, for the guidance and control of that staggering power, as its image of man, as its symbol of man's stature, has nothing to offer but the deformed figure of a brainless dwarf scurrying for cover under a garbage can. I quote from my book for the new intellectual, quote, it is into the midst of this dismal gray vacuum that the new intellectuals must step and must challenge the worshippers of doom, resignation, and death with an attitude best expressed by a paraphrase of an ancient salute. We who are not about to die. Who are to be the new intellectuals? Any man or woman who is willing to think. All those who know that man's life must be guided by reason, those who value their own life and are not willing to surrender it to the cult of despair in the modern jungle of cynical impotence, just as they are not willing to surrender the world to the dark ages and the rule of the brute. In the field of aesthetics, those of you who are sick of the neo-savages of non-objective art should rebel against their dogma that, that the garbage can is the symbol of man's soul. Take them at their word. Grant them their right to reveal their souls in the appropriate form they have chosen. But do not grant them the right to speak for your soul, nor for the soul of man, nor for his sense of life. And do not grant them the title of art. In the face of their maudlin whining that they have given up, flung the fact that you have not. To the motto, we who are not about to die, add, we who are not impotent, we who are not hopeless, we who are not depraved, we whose lives are not banal, nor gritty, nor irrational. Close quote. The correction of a disaster has to begin with the correction of its cause. It is philosophy that has brought us to this state. It is only philosophy that can lead us out. Not the philosophy of the neo-mystics, which has run its course, but the rebirth of a philosophy of reason, that is, a reassertion of man's self-esteem with its three consequences, a rational morality, a rational aesthetics, and a romantic renaissance in art. Our Aesthetic Vacuum, Q&A session with Ayn Rand. A number of rather interesting questions have arisen, I think, on the basis of last week's discussion. Let me begin with this one. Uh, which I'll ask Miss Rand about romanticism. You seem to be operating on a rather different definition of the term romanticism from any of the usual ones. I can't summarize the usual ones very briefly and yet be accurate, but let me give an indication of the way in which the term romanticism seems to be popularly used. Uh, one such way is this, uh, as an escape from the present to the far away in space or also in time. An escape in general to the more pleasant aspects of reality. Faraway princesses, enchanted castles, knighthood, chivalry, and so on. This is certainly associated with the term romanticism. But it has another association too, which supplements but doesn't contradict the first one. Uh, mysticism, a denial of the rational, uh, dream worlds, 
uh, in which reason is no longer paramount. I remember Shelley's line, where moonlight and music and feeling are one. Or again, romanticism as a term has the following association, a distortion of reality, but a distortion of reality in a specific direction, in the direction of pleasurable states of feeling. And of course, this relates back to the first one, uh, what arouses this pleasure escape from the tawdriness of present reality. Then there's a more mediumistic conception of romanticism, I think, uh, on the work of art itself. Emphasis on emotion as opposed to reason. And as a consequence of the emphasis upon emotion uh, and upon what's called the overflow of powerful feeling, uh, we have formlessness since presumably emotions when they're spontaneously expressed can't bother to form themselves uh, into any coherent pattern so formlessness becomes a criterion of romanticism because of lack of control uh, irving babbitt in his book rousseau and romanticism seems to have conceived romanticism uh, in this way whereas another writer f.l lucas in his book the decline and fall of the romantic ideal seems to have conceived romanticism in some of the earlier ways that I mentioned. Now we have here quite a grab bag of concepts of romanticism. They're related, but none of them, of those that I've mentioned, are identical with one another. And yet the concept of romanticism that you seem to be operating with, Miss Rand, is different from all of them. And I think it would be of interest to our listeners if we could hear you specify in somewhat greater detail what you mean by the term romanticism when you use it, as, and when you used it in your lecture last week. Yes, certainly, it was a pleasure. A very interesting question. If you observe <coughs> what all the definitions or approaches you have mentioned have in common, this will help to understand our approach to aesthetics and what is the difference in our method of approach and in its result, namely our method of definition. All the uh, various theories which you have mentioned uh, are not untrue. They are certainly wrong as definitions, but there is an element of truth in all of them, and more than that, it is an element that comes from the same essential. What these theories are guilty of is that they are approaching the issue and defining it by means of non-essentials. Uh, the subject under discussion is romanticism. Each one of the theories you mentioned takes some aspect, which is true of the romantic school, but a superficial aspect. One of the attributes of the object to be defined, but an inessential attribute, meaning an attribute which is not fundamental and which is derived from something more fundamental of which it is only a derivative. There is a cause underlining all the particular aspect which these various theories have chosen. And it is that cause that we consider definitive. In other words, we define by means of fundamentals, not accidentals. Observe that every one of the theories which you mentioned uh, is uh, based on observing something about romantic art which has to do either with the pleasant or the emotional or both. Let me briefly uh, name uh, in what manner. For instance, the first definition says that the romanticism uh, is an escape because it features the pleasanter side. Uh, second theory, mysticism, uh, denial of the rational and escape into dream world. Uh, the third one, pleasurable states uh, which distort reality. That's in effect the same idea. Uh, next one, emotions as opposed to reason, or an overflow of feelings. Then the essential thing is to ask what does pleasure come from and what do emotions come from? And what all these theories have in common is that they gropingly, inexactly, 
are dealing with the problem that romanticism has something to do with the question of values. The common denominator in all these theories is that the romantic school of writing is concerned with values. Emotions, of course, are the psychological state of one's response to values. But that romanticism is primarily focused on or concerned with values is certainly true, only this is the essential which these various theories did not take in consideration. And more than that, that the, uh, uh, romanticism is in some way, I'm not analyzing this series, concerned with positive values or pleasant values, as the authors of this series would state it, that they are concerned with the good. Now, let me repeat what our approach uh, to the issue is. We, I defined in my lecture what we mean by art as a sense of life. I stated that art primarily is a concretization of metaphysics. It is an expression of an artist's uh, view of reality, of the fundamental uh, aspects of reality, the nature of reality, those questions which in philosophy come under the uh, discipline of metaphysics. I said that an artist expresses his view, which he may hold consciously or subconsciously, of the essentials, uh, of the essential nature of man and of existence, of man's relationship to existence. And that one of the most crucial aspects in considering man's relationship to existence is whether man ha possesses free will or is able to make choices, whether man can choose his goals and his values and achieve them, or whether man is a determined entity, that meaning determined by forces outside his control, which direct the ultimate goal of his life and determine his destiny uh, apart from his own uh, wishes or choice in the matter, that no matter what he does, it is some outside power which will ultimately determine his fate. Uh, whether the outside power uh, are the gods uh, or innate characteristics or social background or any other theory of psychological determinism, in any case, in art, the deterministic view of man will consist of the idea that man is incapable uh, of controlling the course of his own life, which means incapable of actually choosing values and achieving them. Observe that all the definitions given uh, in the series that you cited have a metaphysics inbuilt in them. For instance, the ones which say that romanticism is an escape into another world or into pleasurable states of feeling, an escape from the harder or more unpleasant nature of the reality in which we actually live. In other words, the metaphysics behind this approach is that reality is necessarily tragic, sordid, or unpleasant, and that any work of uh, art which presents the pleasant sort of life is an escape or a fantasy. This is obviously a metaphysical approach, because if the author of this series looked around him in a journalistic sense, he would have to say that all of us can observe that there are pleasant things in life and unpleasant. There is tragedy and there are triumphs. Uh, but the author obviously was well, uh, taking a metaphysical viewpoint, his own, which considered life essentially tragic or unpleasant or undesirable or negative. And on that basis, accused the romanticists of an escape because the romanticist w was dealing with values and was in effect implying that men can choose values and that life can be pleasant, if we take pleasant uh, in the widest sense of the word. Therefore, what I would say about all of these definitions, uh, to repeat what I started with, is that they simply are confused in a tangle of non-essentials and particulars. This is especially true 
of the ones who take the subject uh, of a uh, work of art and attempt to make it a definition of the form. For instance, that a great many uh, romantic novels dealt with faraway places or historical subjects rather than dealing with immediate present time, or that they dealt with castles and princesses and knighthood, that is a specific concrete, a particular choice of locale of particular writer. There uh, may be reasons for it, but you cannot take that as the defining characteristic of the Romantic school. Uh, and just to cite one crucial example, I'm sure every theoretician would agree that Victor Hugo is a romanticist, that he belongs to the Romantic school and is, in fact, the greatest representative of the Romantic school. Well, you take a novel like Les Miserables, and it certainly does not deal with far away time and places. It deals with France at the time of, uh, of the author. It, it was then he was writing about contemporary France, but he was writing as a romanticist. He, as his emphasis was on the abstract essentials of man's nature and man's relationship to existence and man as a being who could choose values. The result of it would be a magnificently pleasant view of life. I'm taking your theoretician's word in its highest metaphysical meaning. It would be a positive view of life, even though the content of the novel has many tragic aspects. Why would those theoreticians and still uh, classify it as escape or pleasure, uh, too pleasant or too glamorized? Only for one reason, that the met essential metaphysical view projected would not tell the readers that the nature of reality is sordid, hopeless, or malevolent to men. Uh, therefore, this would be the ground on which I would oppose all the theories. But you can see in relation to the series that the difference between the objectivist definition of the issue and theirs is in fact how deep down into fundamentals does our discussion and approach of the subject reach. Uh, our definition, uh, the objectivist definition of the difference between romanticism and, and naturalism is a metaphysical one. We take it on the level of fundamentals. Uh, that is the essential difference and the reason for the difference between my approach and that of all these theoreticians. Professor Lucas wrote in his book, I remember, that Romanticism began as a very great movement exemplified in the highest works of literature, such as those of Hugo in France and George Eliot in England, and gradually it was a descent, that is a decline and fall, until in today's literature, romanticism chiefly inhabits true story magazines and things of that caliber, but not the not much of the so-called serious literature of our day. Do you agree with this? Oh, uh, yes, I, I agree thoroughly, except for the very last illustration. Yes, that is true, romanticism did start on a grand scale, uh, but I wouldn't agree that it's true story magazine is romanticism because even by its title, uh, it's uh, supposedly alleged to be someone's true life experiences, of course, glamorized and distorted and silly, but I wouldn't classify that as romanticism. I would rather uh, prefer a different example. Today, romanticism has descended either into the so-called costume novel which is a work of light fiction uh, with no profound meaning or theme, usually set in some historical period, or the more valuable remnant of romanticism is the detective story. Now, detective fiction today, artistically, is a quite uh, high quality. There are many writers, not all, uh, but many in detective fiction, which are really literary writers, which have good serious literary qualities, but then neither are, of course, all the so-called serious literary writers good. Uh, but I now speak only of the overall, the total uh, view of a given uh, part of literature. I think the remnant of romanticism today is predominantly in the detective field, and you can see why. Because that is the field which deals with the conflict of values, even if in cruder, simpler terms, the conflict of good or evil. 
Uh, but uh, it's a very interesting subject. We won't have time for it right now to discuss why Romanticism descended. Uh, I would also like to point out that so did Naturalism. It also started with certain grand scale, if you take Balzac or, or Tolstoy. But today, it's practically what Mr. Brandon calls police gazette history. Today, it is a description of the sewer, so that all uh, literature has descended, and there are reasons for it, philosophical reasons, and uh, that descent has affected all schools of literature. I mean, the definition once given of Dos Passos' novel, An Explosion in a Cesspool. Oh, uh, I'm inclined to agree, quite sorry. Many people would say that art should have nothing to do with the conceptual at all. I know you disagree with this entirely, but it's not entirely clear, I think, to uh, many of our listeners what is involved in being on the conceptual level. Uh, artists are not, by and large, uh, intellectuals, nor need they be, at least in non-literary arts, this seems especially obvious. And uh, the traditional romantic, in another sense, view is that art is just an overflow of powerful feeling, and uh, ideas and concepts don't matter very much. Uh, let's uh, make sure here of several different things. Uh, first of all, let's define what the conceptual means. It's in epistemological terms. It is man's ability to form abstractions, <laughs> to organize the perceptual uh, data of his consciousness into wider abstract categories. Uh, to perceive, to be able to deal with more than the immediate concrete perceptual uh, data is that which you perceive immediately before you and around you. To uh, deal with it as uh, an issue of permanent knowledge or to deal with it in terms of human consciousness, you have to integrate that perceptual evidence into concepts or abstractions. Now that is the epistemological base. It is true, and this is what I think is its greatest evil, that the predominant aesthetic theory today is that we should eliminate concepts from art. Epistemologically, that means that we should reduce a man's consciousness in the realm of art to the level of an animal. It is an animal's consciousness that uh, can rise only to the level of percepts. An animal can perceive what is immediately around him. He can distinguish objects, but he cannot form abstractions. Therefore, any theory which would claim that it is proper for man in any of his activities uh, to uh, hold himself down to only the animal level of epistemology, only percepts, but then concepts, man's abstractions, man's reason, man's mind, that level of consciousness which is specifically human and which pertains to man, the only level uh, by means of which man can make uh, reality intelligible, the level proper to man is to be excluded from any human activity. It, that is what those theories amount to and that is what I would certainly object to. Now, this is not the same thing as saying that an artist does not have to be an intellectual. Uh, by intellectual, we really mean a man whose specialty, whose profession or predominant activity consists of dealing with the subjects of the intellect, with the sciences uh, known as the humanities. The man who deals in ideas and concepts. Uh, in a loose sense, one could say the man who deals with philosophy and its immediate derivatives, that is an intellectual. And he has to deal with this subject in conceptual terms. Now, an artist does not have to be an intellectual in the sense that he does not have to be concerned with the identifications and definitions of wide philosophical issues. But he cannot become an artist without having formed some kind of wide conceptual integration. He may form it consciously or subconsciously, and that is where the issue of sense of life enters. Um, some of the greatest artists who may not be intellectual at all, that is, they would not be able to verbalize uh, their subconscious metaphysical views, 
nevertheless had an enormously wide abstract range. Uh, only, it was not their job to translate it <clears throat> into verbal terms. Now, you wouldn't call them intellectual as profession or as approach, but you would certainly call them abstract thinkers. Abstract in the sense that their view of life and what they expressed in their art was not the narrow sensory or perceptual level of an animal. Therefore, it's true that artists do not have to be professional intellectuals, but they have to be a highly developed, abstract human consciousness. Uh, they do not uh, have to remain on the level of percepts in order to be an artist. That is where the mixture in this theory enters. Is it true that the plot, that plot uh, came into its own in the 19th century? Can't one object that plot is as old as Greek drama or older? Doesn't the Oedipus of Sophocles, for example, have as tightly woven, as integrated a plot as any work of literary art could possibly have? Aristotle considered it a virtually perfect example of a flawless plot, with every item <clears throat> introduced into it essential to the development, everything that could possibly be irrelevant omitted, and every occurrence of strict causal relevance to everything that followed in the furtherance of this development. And surely this is not limited to Greek tragedy either, or to Shakespeare, or to any other writer or group of writers. It seems that countless writers prior to the 19th century had excellent plots in their dramas and in their epics and other forms of art as well. Uh, well, uh, to begin with, I certainly would not claim that plot is the specific uh, invention of the 19th century as a literary aspect or a, a literary method. Uh, I also know why I might have given that impression, so I'm glad to elaborate. Uh, my, my sentence was uh, that uh, the new uh, artistic form of the 19th century was the romantic novel, and plot was its proudest distinction. Uh, that could give the impression that uh, the novelty consisted of the plot. Uh, no, what I meant was that the romantic novel was the new literary form, but uh, within that category of the many literary aspects that one could stress or that pertain to a novel, it is the aspect of plot that the romanticist particularly featured for the reasons I explained in my lecture as an expression of man's freedom of choice. Uh, therefore, I do not mean to imply an, uh, that plot was the invention of the romanticist, and I certainly agree with you in the examples you give, uh, that in many uh, works, plot uh, is much older uh, even than Western uh, uh, art or literature, because you could ascribe certain amount of plotting even to ancient legends or mythologies. But it's on this last that I would like to make a certain distinction. Uh, namely, you could only say rudiments of plot or indications of something that resembles the early stages of a plot structure can be found in mythologies or in the epics uh, up in Western literature, in the uh, epics of Homer. This is specifically not really a plot, because by a plot I do not mean a story narrative or merely a succession of events, but a logically connected, purposeful progression of events. So every epic or chronicle would tell a story, it would not necessarily contain a plot. Some parts of such an epic may be a plot <coughs> element. As a whole, an epic is not a purposeful progression of, log of logically connected event that is integrated. I also would like to point out, however, uh, that there is a significant difference between the plots of Greek dramas or the pre-19th century plot, and that which was introduced by the romantic novelists. Now, these are two different approaches to the same aspect of literature. Therefore, while I agree with you that plot certainly existed long before the 19th century, 
I want to emphasize the significance uh, given to plot in romantic novelists and above all the difference in their approach to plot. The difference between them and, for instance, the Greek tragedies or the dramas of Shakespeare. Uh, observe this. Although a Greek tragedy would conform to all the uh, formal definitions which you mentioned, uh, a, a story constructed by means of es essential with nothing irrelevant, each development leading to the next, and so forth, although it contains all the essential from formal aspects of a plot structure, there is a tremendous difference in the content of the plot, the nature of the events which are being dramatized. And that difference pertains to the different philosophy behind the given work of art. In Greek tragedies, although the events follow from each other once they start, both the start of a chain of events and particularly the ending are not determined by the characters of the drama. The actions of the characters follow from some event, some issue over which they really have no control, an issue not of their choice. And the resolution ultimately comes from the gods, from fate, from an issue not of their choice. It, in other words, the characters are not motivated and concluded on the ground of their choices, their values. They're not started nor finished by their own hand. But surely their so-called tragic flaws are flaws in their own characters, not I, flaws in the outside world. Uh, one moment before we come to the tragic flaws, I wanted to first illustrate it on the same example you gave on Oedipus Rex. Observe what enormous tragedies start from what is essentially an issue Oedipus could not help. He made a mistake, uh, he lacked knowledge, he could not know, and therefore that tragic mistake over which he had no control leads inexorably to all the events of the drama. And in fact, the mistake is really earlier than his. You take in any Greek tragedy, some error or some attack of anger uh, makes one man kill another, and thereafter the two families are in, involved in a long progression of feuds or misunderstandings, and in the end, it is resolved by the interference of a god. That is what I would mean by a plot, where the events do follow, and, it is, and they are enacted by men, but the motivation and the ultimate result is not of man's choice. Now, So much for Greek tragedy. That's good tragedy. Uh, now you want to discuss the issue of the tragic flaw. Well, I wanted to ask, for example, would you also say that Macbeth in Shakespeare's tragedy could not have controlled his fate or could not have, could not help being the way he was or having as Shakespeare, ambition? As Shakespeare presented, yes, I would say so. Uh, although Macbeth is a, a, a more human uh, example, uh, there are worse ones in Shakespeare, human in the sense that it appears as if Macbeth is really making a certain choice, and then it's his own evil uh, that precipitates the event. But even then, the way Macbeth is presented, and this applies to all the other tragedies of Shakespeare, Macbeth seems to have an overwhelming passion, ambition. He is its victim. He may have moments when he realizes that this is evil, but he cannot help it. Uh, the power of this passion, which was not of his choice, but which he experiences as, as an irresistible compulsion, that is what precipitates his action and determines the events of the drama. It is more obvious in some of the other tragedies when a, a good man, a man presented as uh, virtuous and intelligent in every respect, succumbs to some one weakness which is presented by the total context of the drama as if it's an issue over which he has no control. I think perhaps Othello is the best known and the uh, one on which it can be seen more clearly. Othello is presented as an intelligent, self-confident, courageous man. The circumstances of his life at the start of the play 
are all in his favor. He has just won a victory. He has a beautiful wife who loves him. All these outside circumstances and all his own personal characteristics are given as positives, as the kind that should lead to happiness and fulfillment. Yet, on a very slender provocation, and I suspect that was Shakespeare's conscious intention, on a very slender provocation of an obvious frame-up by Iago, Othello succumbs uh, to an unbearable jealousy which blinds him to the evidence, blinds him to everything else and forces him to kill his wife. The implication of the total story is that here was a great man defeated by a tragic flaw, by the evil of jealousy which he could not help, over which he had no control. Therefore, in the tragic flow school of writing, uh, and, uh, there are other writers, uh, nowhere of Shakespeare's stature, that have the same metaphysical view of life. In this school, it appears more human because, uh, as compared to the Greek tragedies, because the deterministic element, the element which controls man, is not an outside force, it is not a god. It is inside man, it is a part of his soul. Nevertheless, it is fully as deterministic uh, as the Greek tragedy, because so long as it's an element over which man has no control, man is a determined being. Even if he's given certain latitude in lesser issues, his ultimate fate is determined by something which is not of his own choice, and he cannot help it. This is determinism. What worries me a bit about this is that this may be true to a large extent of the tragic heroes, certainly a larger extent in the Greek drama than in the Shakespearean. It doesn't seem to be particularly true of the main characters in the comedies, or for that matter, in Shakespeare's histories. And even if you go much further back, uh, I remember reading uh, that Voltaire said of Homer's heroes that they made him feel as if he were 20 feet tall. Now, it's true that the Homeric heroes were subject to the whims of the gods, but they had individual efforts of valor in spite of this. What they did uh, could and actually did make quite a difference to the outcome of the battle, and personal valor counted enormously in Homeric warfare, uh, rather more than has been the case since, or is the case in the 20th century, where power of mechanization plus sheer numbers count for far more than any individual heroism. Uh, the view is that if you want individual heroism, go back to Homer. Don't go to the present day. I don't quite see the connection here, because first, we're talking here now then about the issue of characterization or the view of men. Uh, isn't this uh, what you are discussing? Yes. This is not now an issue of plot, but an uh, a related issue. Well, I'm suggesting of, that... Uh, how, view of men, is that the point? Uh, well, uh, your point before, uh, if I don't mistake it, uh, was that in 19th century uh, works, or works beginning in the 19th century, plot came into its own in the sense that the man was the master of his own destiny, That's whereas right. in previous uh, literature this was not the case. And my point about that was that uh, even in the Homeric heroes, uh, w w people are not, to I be see. sure, entirely master of their own destiny, but they are to a very considerable extent. Their individual efforts did make a difference, and that they're I rather see. more heroic in having their, their fate in their own hands and being able to say, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, than is the case in most 20th century works. Uh, now, uh, uh, here I must remind you that we're talking in metaphysical terms, meaning in the nature of a writer's view of man. If a Homeric hero acts better than does some character in a modern novel, that is not the crucial issue. We may say, yes, Homer's heroes are more attractive personalities, but when we ask, what is the author's view of man? Do Homer's heroes have control of their life? The answer is no. Therefore, even if their actions affect their destiny to some extent, like the uh, example of battle, yes, they do affect their destiny, but the ultimate decision 
is up to a power outside of man and therefore no matter how heroic an individual man may be or how attractive he is still helpless metaphysically and that is what a sense of life or art deals with whereas uh, in modern men if you are going to present men's freedom uh, if you are going to dramatize the issue of men's freedom of choice you would not take a modern war as an example of it uh, you could you could i suppose dramatize it even on that background but the issue of being freer or uh, more controlled in any specific activity such as war or any other particular activity is not the real issue to consider when you appraise uh, an author's sense of life and view of men the most heroic man if he is tied and chained he is a hero but he is not free and the issue here is who is the captain of his uh, soul when you use that expression the meaning is not that you may be a captain in any one moment or in any one battle but you are not the captain of the total and of the war uh, therefore the issue here is primarily metaphysical uh, and certainly the writers of ancient Greece had a very exalted view of men they were pro-men they were not uh, against men as such they did not their sense of life did not demand that they despise men quite the opposite but metaphysically they were determinists you have been listening to ayn rand author of atlas shrugged discussing the aesthetic vacuum